welcome to everyone watching. My name is Kayla LaRiviere and I'm the Indigenous intern this summer at the Center for Human Rights Research. Today I am joined by one of U of M's experts, Dr. Jeremy Patzer, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminology at the University of Manitoba. He is Métis, Soto, and German. His research interests lie in Indigenous rights, particularly in the settler state courts, the forms of legal historical resolution and repair employed by settler states in the wake of colonial dispossession, transitional justice, as well as the sociology of law and contemporary theory. His doctoral research examined the development of case law concerning treaty rights, Aboriginal rights, and Aboriginal title in Canada, offering a critical analysis of the ways in which the courts have sought to manage Indigenous rights aspirations in the settler state context. With his research extending into international and comparative examinations of Indigenous rights, Jeremy is a member of the Global Indigenous Rights Research Network and is a co-applicant with his colleagues on the network on a three-year SHRC partnership development grant entitled Decolonizing Settler States, Unraveling Systemic Blockages to Indigenous Rights in State Institutions and Civil Society. He is also currently collaborating with colleagues in several countries on a CIHR funded project entitled Socioeconomic Impacts of COVID-19 on Indigenous Peoples and Newcomers, Canada, US and Mexico Compared. Today's conversation will be around Indigenous rights. As you may know, 2022 will be the 40th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution 1982, which recognizes and affirms Aboriginal rights under Section 35. We will also explore how the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, also known as UNDRIP, has impacted Indigenous rights here in Canada. Good afternoon, Dr. Patzer. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you for having me, Kayla. I hope uh, I can ask you a few questions today, and I'm hoping you can start with explaining how the history of Section 35 was included in the Constitution 1982 and what it meant for Aboriginal rights. Sure. Um, looking at that history, the, the interesting thing is that it was not the first significant modern positive shift in Indigenous rights, but it was still really critically important. So even prior to the Constitution Act 1982, and then the Section 35 that we always talk about that is encased within, we had other things happening, and those were mainly coming out of the courts. In the, starting in the late 1960s through the 70s and the 80s, there were what we call the modern principles of treaty interpretation. And with those principles that the courts were beginning to expound, what they did is they began to hold governments to historical treaty promises, saying, look, you made this promise and we're going to hold you to it. And they also offered more generous and liberal interpretations of those historical treaty promises. The other big thing that kind of presaged and predated uh, the Constitution Act 1982 is what I call the installation of inherence. And that's when the courts begin to recognize Aboriginal rights and title, and they use the term still to this day, Aboriginal, as, as inherent, that they can exist independently of treaties, of statute, and of proclamations. Prior to that, and, and if a court was, was coming at an Indigenous rights case from a really kind of legal positivist perspective, a judge might say, look, if you claim that you have such and such a right or you have title to your traditional territory because it's not ceded, show me how the sovereign, how parliament or how the crown has said that you have those rights. That was the strict legal positivist interpretation. With the installation of inheritance, basically the courts are starting to say, no, we are going to recognize forms of Aboriginal rights and title that are just rooted in prior occupation. They were here first. Perhaps they didn't cede their land or they didn't cede a certain right to fish or to hunt in a certain area. So the installation of inheritance launched the modern land claims negotiation process. It was quite significant. And that is something that was made available to Indigenous peoples who had not signed historical treaties with the Crown concerning their traditional territories. So we had all of that. And that installation of inheritance through the Calder case in 1973 was likely really instrumental in the inclusion of Section 35 in the Constitution Act 1982. And the inclusion of Section 35 on treaty and Aboriginal rights, it came with a lot of struggle and advocacy from Indigenous leaders. It really was not easy to get the federal government and the provinces of the day to listen to Indigenous peoples. At the same time, what's quite interesting is that Section 35 
and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is also in the Constitution Act 1982, they weren't universally liked or desired by Indigenous peoples at the time either. Similar to Bill C-15 and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples today, some Indigenous peoples had questions or misgivings about what the ultimate effects of the new constitution would be. But those misgivings were especially true of something like the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, given that it really is premised on these philosophical liberal underpinnings that perceive of rights through a liberal individual frameworks rather than collective Indigenous frameworks. But largely though, historically, I think we can say Section 35 was a hard fought victory by Indigenous leaders. And it was actually quite a struggle to get the governments of the day to include that in the Constitution Act to recognize existing uh, Aboriginal and treaty rights. For three, I should say, Indigenous peoples, or we'll say categories of Indigenous people, Indian, Métis, and Inuit. Thank you for giving us a little introduction there on the history of Section 35. My next question relates to the impact it has had on cases, and you touched a little bit and mentioned the Calder case. I know from classes that I've taken with you, we've taken up historical cases such as Sparrow and Vander Peet, and I was just wondering how has Section 35 historically impacted Aboriginal rights in court? Mm -hmm. The most immediate change, I mean, I guess maybe this is fairly obvious, the most immediate change is that rights recognized by the courts and governments, we'll say the various types of Indigenous rights, they immediately gained the robustness of constitutional protection. So it created a context, and this was expounded by the Supreme Court of Canada, in which Indigenous rights and title can no longer be unilaterally and permanently extinguished anymore. And the, the SCC, the Supreme Court of Canada, it held that prior to 1982, this was the case, that a rights could just be declared extinguished by parliament and then they would be gone forever. That no longer is the case, according to the Supreme Court of Canada. But the way the courts interpret rights, even constitutional rights, is that rights are not absolute. So it is possible with current jurisprudence and case law that Aboriginal rights and title can be infringed, but because they can't be um, unilaterally extinguished, that infringement has to be temporary. And it also needs proper justification, uh, a fairly high bar of justification. Since 1982 then, what the courts have developed is a massive body of case law and jurisprudence in order to flesh out what constitutionally protected indigenous rights in title should look like in Canada. And keep in mind that Canada is a country, a settler state with a complex and varied settler colonial landscape. We have historical treaties existing in some jurisdictions, such as Manitoba, but not in others, unceded territory in British Columbia, across the north and eastern Canada. Some peoples, some indigenous peoples in Canada fall under the Indian Act, but others do not. Some groups have modern land claims, while others do not. It really is a varied landscape as far as the legal constitutional situation for indigenous peoples. And so the body of case law developed since then has had to be equally complex, we'll say, and varied. It is the legacy then, I think, of Section 35 that has really brought us doctrines that we hear about in the news regularly, things like the honor of the crown, the duty to consult, justified infringement, and so on and so forth. These kinds of things really came into existence uh, and were talked about a lot by the courts after 1982, and some of them flowed directly from attempts to interpret just you know, the short clause of Section 35 you know, affirming and recognizing Indigenous rights for three categories of Indigenous people. Um, and, and then the, the courts really have kind of built up this massive edifice of, of case law and jurisprudence in order to bring that to life. Thank you for that answer. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here, and we're going to talk about UNDRIP, which is the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It's something I feel like a lot of people now are hearing about. It's something new. It's not that new, but new to some people. I know it wasn't until I took one of your classes that I first heard about it. So I was wondering if you can explain UNDRIP and why Canada has been reluctant to implement it into Canadian law. Yeah, so UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it's something that has been, uh, that was negotiated. Uh, indigenous leaders around the world had a hand in coming up with a draft declaration and then it was brought into the hands of member states of the UN in order to take a look at it and ultimately come up with something that they can try and ratify. Uh, 
Now, when this was coming into being and being voted on within the, the context of the UN at this point, more than a decade ago, um, Canada was one of four former British colonies that did not originally vote in favor of the declaration. So it really set itself apart along with New Zealand, Australia, United States. So basically four um, Commonwealth or former Commonwealth settler states voting against the declaration that did ultimately um, get endorsed by the UN. Quite simply, the federal government at the time, and this was the conservative federal government in and around, I believe, 2007, uh, at the time was not comfortable with all of the rights outlined in the declaration, especially those related to land. All four of those countries, though, later endorsed the declaration, strangely enough, um, even without seeing any kind of amendments made to that declaration. But they would often state things like that the declaration was aspirational, that it wasn't legally binding on them as member countries, and that it could be interpreted in a way that aligned with their current legal constitutional obligations towards Indigenous peoples. And it is true, it's worth mentioning that this being a declaration, not a convention, not a treaty, it's not meant to be a binding international instrument, which is why then we have processes, something like along the lines of Bill C-15 to look at implementing or, or domesticating the declaration within the Canadian context. Now, one concept from the declaration really comes to mind that speaks to some of those controversies and debates uh, as well. And that's what we call FPIC, FBIC, or you know, what it really stands for, free part informed consent. So free part informed consent, it is found a number of times in the declaration, it's mentioned in there. And we'll say pundits and opponents of the declaration in Canada, they liken this idea of indigenous peoples having free prior informed consent to being a sort of indigenous veto over resource development, over the economy. Advocates for the declaration though, they said, well, this is really a gross mischaracterization of FPIC in the declaration. Now, given that the declaration itself, it did go under a process of negotiation between member states before being finalized. Member states had a hand in changing the language surrounding FPIC and how it was actually mentioned in the declaration, that the evidence really does seem to be on the side of the declaration's advocates. The language was changed in that negotiation process and ultimately a majority of member states that had a hand in it did approve that final draft with the wording surrounding FPIC. Have courts in Canada referenced UNDRIP, and if so, how? Well, the courts in Canada have referenced UNDRIP, but relatively little. There are other jurisdictions, other countries, where one finds UNDRIP kind of manifesting in their, in their case law and their jurisprudence uh, a little bit more prominently. I'm thinking um, with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in Latin America, even there are certain kinds of courts and, and other kind of um, fora within places like New Zealand, where there's been mention specifically of the declaration. Now in Canada, I mean, so far I've encountered just some passing references to it in some Ontario cases. So nothing really up at the Supreme Court of Canada level. Uh, and they mentioned this as something that might help inform analyses of human rights or charter rights concerning indigenous claimants something that gives context to their analysis, but not necessarily binding um, or determinative. A federal court ruling in 2013 said that the declaration at that time didn't create substantive legal rights in Canada, but that it could inform the court's approach to interpreting statute. And also then what I'll mention is that at a time when UNDRIP's concept of free prime informed consent was creating controversy in Canada, the Supreme Court of Canada also released the decisions for Chippewa the Thames and the Clyde River cases, in which it just asserts that the duty consult doesn't offer Indigenous peoples a hard right of veto over final crown decisions. So it, it was kind of a situation where it was seemed like an oblique reference that was not particularly helpful. Um, it used language that seemingly echoed or invoked the criticisms from the Declaration's detractors without really offering anything substantive or doctrinally productive on the declaration. Um, forgive my use of the term, uh, the, the expression, but really what it felt to me when I first kind of heard about and read it a little into the cases was that, you know, was this the Supreme Court of Canada throwing shade at uh, the concept of FPIC within, within UNDRIP? And that's pretty much all we have. So it's not on the level, I feel, yet of, of some other countries that have endorsed UNDRIP. 
Thank you for explaining that. I know you mentioned earlier how Canada was one of the four countries who didn't want to implement it right away. And I know now there's some talk of Bill C-15, and I was wondering if you can explain a little bit about that to people and what should they know about Bill C-15? Sure. Bill C-15 is the third iteration of efforts begun by Romeo Saganash, a former NDP member of parliament who is Cree from Northern Quebec. So, uh, you know, appreciation really has to be and uh, given is due Romeo Saganash and his efforts. Now, the first two private members bills he put forward didn't survive through the parliamentary process. And this current bill, C-15, it's the current Liberal government's promise to have Romeo's vision come to pass. And it is meant to be about the domestication or the implementation of uh, the declaration within Canada, right? Because again, being a declaration, it's, it's something that exists more on a political normative level when it's created by a body like the UN. It's not meant to be something um, that is immediately binding on all member states. It's not a treaty, it's not a convention. So in order to, we'll say proverbially, put our money where our mouth is in Canada, to have some sort of implementation uh, or domestication of something like the Declaration in Canada, we need some sort of process actually bringing it within Canadian law. So Bill C-15, it now has been passed and proclaimed as of this past summer, I think perhaps finally in June of 2021. It puts in place a process for working toward three commitments. And the first one is working collaborative, collaboratively with Indigenous peoples to ensure laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration. And it's also meant, number two, to work collaboratively to prepare and implement a comprehensive action plan to this effect. And number three, the third commitment is for the minister, the federal minister, to actually put out regular public reports on the progress that is being made. So the advocates for Bill C-15, or we should say it's now a law, the advocates for C-15 have stressed that the law requires collaboration with Indigenous peoples, it requires transparency on the part of the government, Furthermore, the bill had all kinds of preamble clauses in it, and they set out important rights and principles that must be respected in the process, including recognizing the inherent right to self-determination that Indigenous peoples in Canada are recognized as having. Also worth noting in Bill C-15 is that there was what they call a non-derogation clause. So because we do have, like we said now, 40 years worth of case law and jurisprudence relating to our Constitution Act 1982, and those have been very fruitful as far as doctrinal productivity, right? There's all kinds of case law that speaks to what kind of rights Indigenous peoples have and what kind of obligations that governments and the Crown have towards Indigenous peoples. So with a non-derogation clause, it's basically expressing that rights protected under the Canadian Constitution are not to be ignored, violated, or diminished, no matter how C-15 gets interpreted, right? So it's just kind of a a warning out there when we interpret what we're putting into C-15 here, it's not meant to be construed as diminishing in any way or abrogating or derogating from constitutional rights that we do now recognize. So in other words, that non-derogation clause is meant to ensure that all existing rights for Indigenous peoples in Canada are protected and the new law cannot be used in any way to diminish them. Lastly, the one thing I'd say about C-15 and this is especially coming from an Indigenous researcher whose research focuses primarily on the courts. I think I'd stress at this point that Canadian courts, like I said, they don't have a significant amount of direct uptake of the declaration as of yet. That is to say that the use of the declaration that is direct and determinative uh, on substantive issues concerning Indigenous peoples, it's not really there. So it would seem to suggest that perhaps it is time to look at the advancements of Indigenous rights in Canada that we can make through political and legislative means rather than just through case law in the courts. Maybe we've kind of seen a lot of the advancements we can seek from the courts. Um, maybe they've, they've kind of run their ground. And at this point, the push should be more through these legislative and political frameworks like we have with something like the passage of Bill C-15 and the implementation of UNDRIP in Canada, the potential implementation of UNDRIP in Canada. Of course, we always have to see how these things bear out.
Thank you so much for taking the time to share your knowledge and expertise with us today on this very important topic. I hope those watching have learned something new. I know I definitely have on Bill C-15. I hope you all watching and you, Dr. Jeremy Patzer, have a great day. It was my pleasure, Kayla. Thanks for giving me the time.